I'm Jessie Steigerwald and we're here at Cary Memorial Library in Lexington, Massachusetts for season two of Art Talk. Today we're going to look at a very exciting installation inside that's going to be by artist Wen Ti Sen. Now Wen Ti's works across media. He's got some oil paintings we'll take a look at. He has comic book illustrations and a very exciting development. He has some photographic sculptures. So come on inside. Hi, so Wenti, it's really exciting to have you here in Cary Library. Um, first, just let me know, you live in Cambridge, but you've done a lot of work in Boston, is that right? Um, yeah, uh, in, in, uh, mostly in, uh, around Chinatown, I think in Boston, but uh, yeah, right. So as we speak today, I want to talk about your current work here at the library yeah. first, and then talk more about how you practice your art. So I'm... Right now behind us, we're looking at one of your large-scale oil paintings, and I believe this captures some friends of yours. Right. Yes, um, that's one aspect of the, the thing that I do. Is uh, When I say I worked in Chinatown, it's actually the other part of where I do most of my work is in my studio, in, the, in my home. And, and this is a series that I've been working on um, for the last... 12 years, I think almost, that are six paintings that have come. Six of them will be shown here, and, uh, and this, uh, I'm now continuing on with two other new ones that I'm planning to. Now, do these feature the same central figures, all six panels, or are they different families? No, it's, uh, the funny thing was, no, they were friends of mine for many, many years. I met them when they were young people in Beirut, Lebanon. And the idea was that they were, at that time in Beirut, was very, in the early 70s, very booming and a lot of cafe life and all that stuff. And then I met them, I, there was a break because of civil war and I came home and we se had our lives separately. And then, um, mm, then we met up again and he went to, got an MFA and was a professor in New Hampshire mm -hmm. and got a, you know, let's start living in, Concord, New Hampshire. And what started off actually was when we were having you know, holidays together and parties and stuff, stuff like that. We were having a wonderful Christmas, post-Christmas you know, dinner together and they came all the way from Concord to our house. And it was getting late and I said, why don't you just stay over? And both Farid, who is the, the man, and, and uh, Silva, the woman, by that time they were, I first met them when they were 20 or something, and then by that time they were, you know, 40 something, quite likely. And, and their daughter, all three of them together, said, No way, we have to go home and take care of our dog, Duke. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought back to the time when I first met them in Beirut, and that, you no, know, they can stay up all night talking right. in the cafes and you know, would never think of, especially for Reed, never think of doing, uh, going home. Dogs are just not important things. <laughs> so I thought, you no, know, it's like a, that's really an American kind of, he's very incorporated uh, into an American person. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and then I started investigating. But of course, it, you know, what it resonates is a certain amount of, feelings inside myself, which part of me is Chinese and which part of me is American and which part of me is other places. And like like for Ethan Silver, they have been you know, around, they speak French, Arabic, you know, Silver is Armenian. So there's all these different cultures that's inside them. And how do we represent them in a painting, you know, in the work of art? So I got to thinking. So it's all six paintings about their their life as Americans. So what I eliminated right from the beginning of them as artists, and uh, uh, Silver as a poet, and Farid as a, a wonderful painter, or as college professors. So I'm just looking at their 
how, what they are that they seem to be American. At the same time, underneath all that stuff is their cultural you know, resonance inside that has kept them different from you know, a, a Concord, New Hampshire. So I make a very plain, simple title of Concord, New Hampshire, but all six paintings about varying of that uh, moving from the one world to the other. Well, when we look at the painting, it's true. What what I see as a viewer is looks like an American domestic, maybe suburban, maybe rural. It's hard to tell. Could be an apartment. We don't really see outside the windows. Mm -hmm. um, did they sit for the painting, or did you take a photograph and work from a photograph? I took tons of photographs and videos, even you know, mm -hmm. with them moving around and things like that. And I also so. It's a combination of using, you know, Photoshop and <laughs> and uh, and capture, you know, video capture and things like that. And so this one's added on the component that they were there at the beginning of the first Iraq, uh, no, the Iraq War of the uh, shock and awe of the Iraq War. So what they're watching is on the, you know, the, the CNN or TV. So that is the introduction. Now only after a while you start to realize it, and. And I think what it expressed more for me than anything else is, is the kind of when we are far away from the conflict, your feelings of what it is that you have been feeling very strongly about at the same time you are in a different situation and you cannot just express how you all the complexity of your feeling, how do you, you know you see your almost like a home place being you know, destroyed. So they were being kind of blank about it. At the same time, there's Duke, the dog that they had to go home to. <laughs> right. And he has, being an animal, being you know, true to nature, they reflect what the adult, uh, humans you know, are feeling. So the dog, I was able to express in the dog all the feeling that they are feeling inside of how you know, terrified everything are. So it's like, uh, that's, that's kind of fun. You know, so like, it took me about six months to do the painting and, and, uh, and it's rather straightforward in the sense of, you know, it's like representing a traditional Western paint, oil painting with a perspective, all that stuff. At the same time, there's a feeling of light and dark and all those things. But in that, within that, there's the feeling of, of uh, some kind of destructiveness that is not the... Uh... If you were working with art students, where would you say you would enter this painting? I know when I look at uh, it, I'm, I'm really captivated by yeah. certain areas, and I'm curious as the creator where you enter it. Huh. That's curious. I would say on the... People usually look at the faces first. So I would say look at the faces of the two figures and then follow their eyes to look at the at the television set. And I hope that you know, eventually they'll look at the woman in the back, which is rather in the, you know, so framed in such a way that is a, I, I can reference my you know, paint, certain kind of paintings I love, like Vermeer and things like that. And then slowly I would say to discover the dog only at the end so that they, you know, the, and the eyes of the dog would be, hopefully they would not be seeing that, they will be incomprehensible if they were looking at it at the beginning. But if they come to through the whole thing and coming back to it, I think it will make much more sense in that way. There's a, there's a lot of space in this room. You know, we're sitting in a living room at the library. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I really love about having this piece here is I, I will come back and watch how people interact with the picture. Um, you've spoken quite a bit in other interviews about thinking about what is central, what is centralized, what is marginalized. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested for you, working as an artist, what feels like your center when you're creating? Is it ideas? Is it images? Is it relationships? What What's at your center? Well, I, th I think as an artist, Mm, there's that ego quality of being centered in the person, as, as a person, that it's the, everything so reflected through the artist's eyes kind of thing. At the same time, it's something I kind of disdain of being coming back into me. So essentially, the, what is around is what is around is the world that is around. Going through a kind of like a, 
uh, a gateway through the per the artist person and then re reflect back out. So the viewers, when they look at the painting, would be the person who would be taking in. They're not concerned with the artist so much as with the with themselves. So that whatever reflection of the world is in, it's through the painting will be more how they viewed the world. And so the painting will be that, you know, again, through their gateway of coming through them. And they can interpret it whichever way they do. If the painting is good enough, then they will, <laughs> it will limit the gateway in such a way so that there's a narrow <laughs> path that they come through. That will be, because it's not so much the idea, it's what, there is something that I would like them to, to, to listen to within themselves is that they are open to the whole world, you know, through their own self, and that everybody has that you know gateway through that to go into, that is to to see the world through all these openings. I think one of the things I find fascinating about your portrait. The portrait, they're portraits, but they're from photographs. Mm -hmm. um, I guess in my mind, they, they speak like interruptions, this kind of contemporary art form where people are interrupting or intervening uh -huh. in the landscape. And as you walk through the library, you can't miss these people who are surrounding us. And that sounds like you're almost forcing the viewer to have those kinds of relationships with your work that you want them to have. Right. I think that's what is so wonderful, actually, showing in the Carey Library here. Um, and to see the reaction, you know, the different community have different uh, reaction to these people. And and it fits in very well because, you know, it's the space and, and the people and, and the walking among them. But it's totally different to the the last time that it was designed for. It was designed for the streets in, in Chinatown and was displayed there for about three weeks. And people were looking at them uh, sympathetically, but mostly people were just walking by and just, oh yeah, it's another person. <laughs> and whereas here, there's much more you know, concentration and that people can relate to them. And I especially like those two, you know, two sisters. That was the one that it was in Chinatown. There was a lot of um, people did draw a lot of attention because it was played right in the middle of Chinatown in Har on Harrison Avenue in front of a restaurant. And people would stop by in and out of restaurants and pose with selfies and things like that with them. <laughs> That's more the tendency right. toward that. They Rather than looking at them, they use them as props for their own lives. But uh, I don't know how we may just set up here. I don't know how it will be, but uh, I love the, the way it's set up, that the opportunity of reaching a totally different population and communicating with them the differences. Yeah. There's been some shifts. So you've spoken about, well, some of your activism through art has been around gentrification and the threats that were made on people who were residing in Chinatown losing their housing. So I think I read that the Asian population in Chinatown had gone from about over 70% to closer to 40%. Mm -hmm. Here in Lexington, actually, we've had almost a reverse mm -hmm. in our demographic mm -hmm. change. Right. We've had a, a real increase mm -hmm. in Asians, South Asian families moving into Lexington. Mm -hmm. But it's much more recent, mm -hmm. and these pictures are set back in time. So I'm interested in um, understanding how you chose this moment in time right. to bring these figures into our contemporary lives. Yeah. Chinatown is a very funny thing because it's it started being established about 100 years ago, so it was uh, you know, workers from the railroad workers who might because of losing jobs and things like that over in the West Coast to move over here, and and Chinatown was one of the you know, rejected part of uh, Boston that, that used to be immigrant Syrians and so Chinese just settled there uh, because the the city people were moving out because the streetcar lines into the suburbs, like Brookline and then uh, then Lexington and all that stuff, and those Father Newton and all that. So Chinatown becomes not so much a residential place as a center for for Chinese people who have moved out to these different suburbs to come into the 
to have restaurants for food and things like that. So there's a big discrepancy between the suburban Chinese population and the local people who keep coming in from new immigrants. So what we're hoping for is to survive as a kind of a unit without turning into a tourist place. At the same time, have enough Chinese um, ownership in shops and things like that, house buildings and things like that, so that people, more and more people are living around outside of Boston with a, where the cheaper housings are, like uh, Quincy and Dorchester and things like that. But they will keep on using Chinatown as a center for, pe for, for connections, because you can be north, south, east, west, no, coming to the place that they can connect up easiest. And I, it was a little bit hard to find the photographs in the archives that represented what I want of people just, you know, photographs of people looking directly, eye to eye kind of contact, which is, I think is the only respectful way that a person can face each other is by making that direct contact. Because only wealthy people in the 19, early 19th century, have, or 20th century rather, uh, have you know, take photographs of themselves, so they're all dressed up in things. And, and the other, for the two girls, I think is you know, posted from, they're trying to find maids, maybe their pictures taken in China, and sent over here looking for husbands. And the husband of one and the other, I assume they're sisters, could be, one could be in Idaho, one could be in mm -hmm. New Hampshire. So they may never see, once they're married, into a most likely Chinese-American you know, man who's been working here, you know, say that's in the 1930s or something. They would never see each other again, or hardly, you know. So, so I think the clinging on to each other has very meaningful uh, effect in the sense that it's like the Chinatown itself serves that as those hands holding each other, that so that there's a geographic you know, proximity that that the, the the center creates, and that we need to to preserve, that the city need to preserve for the greater you know, greater uh, Chinese American, Asian American population around the country, you know, like all of New England use Chinatown in that way. So so. When it's displayed in Chinatown, I find it very kind of you know, moving because I'm putting them out there. Once it's out of my hands, they are out there. And when I see people taking selfies, you no, know, could be from you no know, San Francisco or something. You no, know, they then they they are connecting up with their you no, know, their like parents could be who have been distributed that they don't know about. So we pulled these together to have the woman who's dressed in, in very fine attire oh, yeah, right. and then to have the working people because you've spoken about yeah. that you made a careful choice in mm. having a range of people represented. Yeah. I'm curious about the creation of these. Did you start with them in a very small scale in the photograph and then slowly increase them or do you pick one out and then know you need to, to expand that one? Well, with the eye-to-eye -eye ones, I had no more or less. I think I can only handle about twelve figures, okay. you know, twelve sets of figures. So I collected about you no know, obvious one like her. That is, you know, as a fine lady that is presented with a photo uh, in the archive. So I picked about eight of them, and then I had to re look really hard. I want to have something that will represent the working class people and especially a laundry man. That. Was so these are glossies that is in the archive that were of the the woman, but then I have to look very hard on to look for a laundry man who's you know who's represented because people from like photographers from Boston Globe would take pictures of laundry Chinese laundries like cute little babies crawling over laundry baskets and things which will not do for me at all right. or, or, right. or laundry men looking sideways no hard work and all this stuff. what I want is someone who has a lot of pride in what a person as a person so I did find one that is in the book that is about this size and it's printed with a half tone print on it and it's one of the, it's on the okay. upper level, yeah. And so I blow it up into, you know, like 500%. I took photographs and then I keep blowing it up and photoshopped it and, <laughs> and cleaned it up. And so the half tone on his jacket became 
like a dot over the place. And when I put the process is photographs, I use just basic uh, Xerox enlargements. And then I glued them on and coated it. And then essentially using uh, paint as a, as a glaze on top of it. Mm -hmm. So I was just actually a side issue is I figure out how easy it is for people like Leonardo doing a black and white drawing and blow it up and paint and then glazed over the whole thing. It was much easier than doing direct painting. That was started by the Impressionists, right. that you're not allowed to do glazing. <laughs> so, so it's actually, you know, to glaze over the face of these people. So the, so the, 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 the laundry man with a half tone I glazed over with a kind of brown and thing. It turned into a tweed jacket that he might have picked up in some, you know, uh, Morgan Memorial or something like that. So, which suited my purpose perfectly well. Just an incidental incident of of the blowing up, turning half and a half tone dots into into a tweed jacket. <laughs> well, the scale. Now, you've been producing art for decades. And what things do you feel like are consistent in your work? And what are some areas where you feel that you've changed? I think the most consistent thing as I've developed is I used to just do work for myself. And as I work along, I think I have a certain amount of skill doing art in, in whatever. The longer I work at it, the more skill I've picked up in different ways. So. Uh, the purpose of that art, like you know, the mural, I generally would not be inclined to a mural that is, that is appeal to the you know, popular taste like the um, <clears throat> is useful and successful in that way of working with people and getting the reviews. Different, we got a lot of reviews for the design through community meetings and things like that. So that. The mural that was created is, is an expression of the community rather than of myself. And that is satisfactory. And the, the fact that it's successful, that people will keep using it, is because of that in, integration of their, themselves into the thing. So I think as an artist, one just have to constantly look at what is the purpose of that particular art. You know, like, like doing it for the streets of Chinatown is different to doing it for the my home you know, home consumption of essentially of a viewer of one you know, which is for myself, whereas the other ones is for the uh, for the whole you know, all the transient people through the streets of Chinatown, and later then it can be if it brought here, then all the people walking through still have a meaning. Uh, so. In this particular case, I'm so happy is that I can show both the oil painting that was supposed to be for we viewer one, as well as those things that I you know done for viewers of hundreds that will be you know, constantly going through. It, there's the additional one of the the comic book, which will be is even you know targeted at different uh, audience altogether. So the satisfaction is getting all these different use of the art and you applying in the highest way of what I you know, need to do to apply my skill that will be workable for different occasions. I think that is the, you know, the, the rather uh, good feeling of being an artist at this point. You, know. you open up the newspaper and you're reading about upcoming artists shows. Which artists working now or which artists in the past make you really excited and you're not going to miss that show? <laughs> Uh, it's mostly form, actually, artists, I, I, I find. It's, um, the constant imagination developing uh, of, of uh, changes of form. And so mostly I can read about them, but I never have much opportunity to go actually, go to see them. Like if I see something in New York, that something struck me as fantastic. There was like a Korean artist who reproduced a whole temple in transparent uh, silk cloth or something. It's it just an, a, endlessly one would look at all these imaginations at work and one is shamelessly would be, oh, what can I do with that kind of thing and, and try to borrow it the next time, you know. And, 
but of course you don't actually you know, steal for them, but you influence by by all these different artists. So by constantly looking at the different forms that people are developing, and not as consumer products, but as just you know as people's ideas are changing and looking at things differently, it all becomes you know, fascinating. I think that way. I know your mom was also a painter, mm -hmm. and I'm curious in terms of generations if you feel that uh, your work connects. To her work or that your interest in art was inspired or you talked before about disdain sometimes and I'm, I'm curious about that relationship having had a parent who expressed themselves visually as well yeah I guess my feeling about I mean I, I respect her work for what she was doing at the time and she was the first uh, Chinese Western you know, uh, uh, really uh, educated artist one of the first and what she was exploring was trying to combine, you know, Chinese and Western style in a in a in a artistic way. Uh, I think I took that in as you know was given, and that we have to move on from there. Uh, and I'm exploring something totally different, not 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 Chinese sensibilities or anything like that. And the interesting thing is actually. My daughter is also a, an artist. She is a mm, artist photographer mm -hmm. using photography as an uh, art form, and she you know, works out of Chicago. And she does these fantastic conceptual kind of things, also about communities things, but totally different to what I do, <laughs> but from a different angle, using her medium in such a way that I dress even more she, uh, strongly. What is, what is underneath the society? Uh, she would go for uh, one of her art form is to give travel talks in the underground passages in Chicago of how the big buildings and the working part are different. So by giving these talks, you know, so like draws people into a totally different understanding of the society uh, discrepancies, but which is very much my mother's you no know, contact also about about but done in her way of understanding the Chinese society in that way. So ever. It's just just a way that what one learned at the beginning. And what one learned at the beginning is actually a big limitation. You know, once I finish learning painting, that's the thing that I can do best. I can draw, I can paint. But I cannot you know I can take photographs, but but I cannot do a lot of the things that you know that other generations of people can do. That uh, that everybody has their abilities, and everybody use their abilities in whichever way they want to. I think that's the you know, the wonderful thing about being an artist that you can always it's a play. I mean, it's like I see my six year old grandchild was drawing, and we were doing face to face drawings of each other. And I did a straight, you know, rather, uh, you know, as best I could, pencil drawing of her sitting on the couch, and she was doing in her way her best drawing of of me sitting across on the couch, and both of them are <laughs> very valid, uh, you know, representations of each other. Well, thank you so much for bringing the work here to Lexington because I think it opens the door for us to see the playful side of very different forms yeah. and really appreciate it and encourage everyone to come down to Cary Library. Uh, the work will be on display here through June 30th and you don't have to look far. It's all around the library. It's really an immersive experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a wonderful interview. Thank, thank you, you very much.